take no. So, I apologize in advance. I am terribly out of practice, but perhaps you will get more information from my mistakes than you would get if I just came up here and went whisk, 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 and came up with a masterpiece. And you'll go away wondering, what did she do? What did she do? But uh, today you'll know what I did because I'll say, oops, <laughs> and then you'll know. Okay, without any further... What do you do when you're not painting? Um, well, I paint, but I do, I'm playing with other, other media now. I've painted in, <coughs> in, um, in watercolor now since 1946. And um, a combination of the events, uh, <coughs> one was just ordinary artistic burnout, uh, another was the loss of my eye, which has made it extremely difficult to paint the same style that I used to right. paint, which was highly detailed, and I don't see that well anymore. So, um, uh, a combination of things gave me an excuse to quit, actually. It was a great relief. <laughs> I had cancer. No. You want to share uh, why you have that incredible eye patch on and how many more are at home? <laughs> well, this is a rather tame one, actually. Um, well, I just decided that as long as I have to go around with a billboard on my face, I might as well make it artistic. So I asked all my artist friends to come up with these things, distributed patterns to everybody, and I have about 40 eye patches. That, well, I mean, you might as well. I've got to wear it all the time anyway. So. Some of them are so wild. Oh, I have to tell you a story. Uh, you're all familiar with Peggy Mori. You know yes. Peggy Mori. Well, Peggy lives down in Arizona now, and she heard about this, and, and she said, oh, poor Liz, I've got to make her an eye patch. So she did. She made this elaborate thing, as only Peggy can do, with a three-dimensional lizard that came swooping across my <laughs> with a, a tail that went up my cheek. Like, uh, the only problem was she made it for the wrong eye. <laughs> so when I got it and tried to wear it, the tail goes right up my neck. <laughs> so anyway, and I'm selling advertising space, if anybody needs <laughs> My my husband's grandmother um, lived to be 90 years old, and she, I think, must have been for 40 years, she lost her eye with cancer, too. She had this one eye, but leave me that eye, and it kept coming every 50 years. Well, Bob, well, I'm doing something that I haven't done before, and I never do florals. So today I thought, well, okay, I'll do a floral. <laughs> So Good. this little still life that I brought, uh, and unfortunately it's the remains of my rose garden, which that was all there was. So um, I'm going to um, I'm going to try to paint flowers today, and I really don't know how to do this. Bear with me. Uh, I use a 140-pound arches rough paper, and I stretch it on canvas stretchers like this, um, just like you'd stretch a canvas, and it comes out very very tight. And the reason for that is I like to paint extremely wet. And the paper buckles so when it's very wet, it kind of goes this way and things run down into the valleys and gets out of hand. So this way I can really soak this and it does not lose its, its uh, tightness. And it's lightweight. I can turn it around and flip it over and use the back side, and, you know, things like that. And do you use the stretchers again? Oh, yes. Oh, yes. Yeah, you can use the stretchers. Not only that, but you can... Um, I have in my studio, I have a box full of various size stretchers all the way from about five feet tall down to 12 inches. And I can make long, skinny pictures or, you know, any size that I want to. And I'm fortunate that my husband does my framing for me, so I don't have to paint to custom frame sizes. I mean, to uh, regular frame sizes. Okay. Um, do you mind if I don't use that? Okay. Now, first thing, I'm going to just describe what I'm doing here as I go along. And it may seem to you that I'm taking a lot of time with these preambles, but um, any of you that have ever studied with me know that I count this as being probably the most important part of the painting. What I'm doing now, actually what I've done already, and just choosing the objects that I'm going to paint here, um, I don't need that up there. Um, I have... Uh, already kind of composed the painting to some extent. Um, I've chosen the colors, and you can't go wrong with primaries. I don't know why this happens, but in many of my paintings, I find out after I've painted them, 
my gosh, there they are again, those three primaries. I've got red, yellow, and blue. And so that's what I have again here today. So what I want to do is just kind of divide this space up somehow so that it looks more or less like it's, uh, it's going to be. And I'm not, I'm not spending any time on this. is what I call a thumbnail. And what it does is it helps me organize the objects that I'm going to paint in the space that I have. And uh, I, will, I can change this very easily without any expenditure of time and effort. And um, I'm looking to uh, try to get it in the, in the space of the um, uh, four lines that I already have. Uh, this, this area here is already part of the composition. I can't help that. And everything that I put in that space has got to relate to those four lines that are already there. So this is what I'm, I'm doing now. I'm just kind of organizing my thoughts here to see how it's going to work. And I can move the edges around. I've deliberately put this little other chunk of lemon over here to the left so that the lemons themselves will not be the only spot of yellow in the painting. You know, I've been doing a lot of computer art lately, just for fun. And I have a, uh, what do they call it, a sketch pad with a stylus that you can draw on it. All I have to do is turn it over and I can erase things. It's really great. I can't do that with this pencil. So. <coughs> and then, of course, if it really gets out of hand, I just push a button and delete it. How do you like the computer art? Uh, it's a lot of fun. It's a lot of fun. I don't see... Uh, myself doing it in any way that is, uh, you know, uh, really a serious application, but uh, more of a fun thing. It's I, I'm doing it just for fun. Mm -hmm. This is kind of nice because I have top lighting on those lemons, and I think that's going to be kind of, which means that I can leave the light area at the top. And instead of this bare table underneath it, what I would like to do is to put a cloth under that. So I think what I'm going to do is sort of invent one here that uh, maybe has a couple of little... So that didn't yeah. take me very long. And yet what I've done here is make many of the most important decisions that I'm going to have to make. It's just in that one little thing. If I didn't like that, I could try doing something different with it. I could try making it horizontal. I could change the things around. But if I come up with something here that is more or less acceptable, and today that's all I'm asking of myself, <laughs> uh, then what I do is I'll take a red pencil and I'll square this off. I just write drawing, and the reason for the red is so that I can see through it. And I'll just divide this into quarters, vertically and horizontally. And do the same thing to my, my paper, very lightly, so that I can transfer those proportions that I have more or less worked out there onto the paper without too much distortion. <coughs> and I don't want to do a lot of erasing in my drawing here because if I rough up the surface of the watercolor paper, it's going to show as dark smudges in the final painting. Oh, incidentally, I, d I should, while I'm doing this, I can talk at the same time. Uh, in case, <laughs> in case this video does not turn out. This is a paid commercial announcement. <laughs> I have a video that I put out some years ago of the doing of a complete painting, one of the people paintings that I think some of you have seen. There are three old men sitting on bales of hay in front of a hardware store. 
It's a two-hour video, and uh, I did it myself. It's pretty crude, it's but all of them, you have it? It's wonderful. I've watched it many, many times. Well, okay, there's, <laughs> there's a testimonial here on the payroll, my dear. <laughs> <laughs> And I have that available. It costs $45. So if you um, have a little bit of extra money <laughs> than what uh, this video is going to be, that is a possibility. Also, I have a drawing class in Brookings that's starting um, a week from next Monday. Um, it's a five-day <coughs> workshop, six hours a day for five days. And it's pretty intensive. <coughs> And so, uh, unfortunately, it's full. But oh, I'm well. taking. <laughs> yeah, right. Much for that. <laughs> that's that's a big help, I know. But if Good. there are, a, I have a couple of people on the waiting list now, and if there are enough people who uh, want the class, I will give another section of it. What's the cost? It costs one hundred and twenty-five dollars for the five days. Liz, are you still doing the cookies or not? Yes, uh, I haven't been because we've been traveling this spring. But um, uh, it's starting again on the 6th of July, on Friday mornings in Brookings um, for three hours in the morning. People bring in um, work in progress or, or um, paintings that they have finished. And um, for some reason or another, they're allowing me to tear them apart. <laughs> How many can you bring? As many as you want. <laughs> well, <laughs> within limits, I suppose. No, we've never had more than we could handle. Just leave your ego at home. Oh, I'm pretty kind. I usually find something good about it. But it's, it's kind of nice, and the people who have been doing this for some time claim that it really has helped them because it... Um, uh, sometimes having two heads are better than one, as long as they're on different people. <laughs> and um, okay, now I I've got enough here I think so that I can start. Let me get this. Checking on this one here. buyer wonders if I could take the names of everyone interested in your video, their names and addresses. And fine, that's okay. fine. I will do that. If I mail it to you, there's three dollars uh, postage on it. But, um, 48. Hmm? So it's 48. It's 48 if I mail it to you. If there's some way that you can get up to Brookings and come out to my studio, you can have it for 45. Okay. Now I can start some serious considerations here. Yeah, right. This uh, poses some rather interesting problems here because um, I have transparent glass to render as well as um, flowers, which I neither one of which I know how to paint. Well, you say, oh, yeah, you know, <laughs> just wait. <laughs> Actually, it's kind of nice. I can remember going to um, uh, demonstrations by so-called high-powered artists and watching them once in a while, if they make a goof, it is absolutely delightful. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to find a little peak hole here. Did you hear me? Mm -hmm. I'm going to find a peak hole. You don't know what I am. <laughs> I can see quite a bit. <coughs> so. Now, I may, I'm spending some time on this drawing, which is okay. Because the painting goes fast. The drawing is important. Without that, mm 
nice thing about doing things like lemons and flowers is that nobody can come around afterward and say, well, it didn't look like that. round, like a, 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 a vase or a cup, of, a cup of saucer or a bowl or something like that. Be very, very careful about your, your ellipses because um, it's, very, it's very easy, it's very easy to get them so that they are out of perspective as the um, as the bowl or, or vase or whatever it is um, gets closer to your horizon line, which is your line of sight. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it will. Mm -hmm. It better because if once I get a wash on this, if it doesn't show through, I've lost my drawing. <laughs> However, it will erase through the watercolor. Um, by the use of, I'm going to have to widen that bowl a little bit. I don't think I like it quite that narrow. Um, it, it will uh, erase through the watercolor with the use of a very mild uh, drafting eraser. And if it's if the water if the watercolor is not too dark, if it's too dark, then of course it won't. But um, On the other hand, if it's too dark, you can't see the pencil line through it anyway. No, you can't Can everybody hear me okay? Yeah. Okay. Don't <laughs> Now I can make those lemons a little bit more generous size. Because could, you of, could you occasionally hold your picture up for those? I of sure will. <laughs> if you want me to do that at any time except in the middle of a runny wash, just holler and I'll do it right now. Holler. Okay. <laughs> It's two hours. Okay, so and this one is a half an hour. This is two hours, and it's of course, it's a painting that took me probably twenty hours to do. So uh, it's you know, it's been. How to put lettering on glass? You know, on a, a glass behind the. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I can tell them what all the teachers did. <laughs> Go ahead. While I'm working, you talk. Okay. <laughs> These flowers are going to be fun because they're, this is a, uh, it's a very, very deep, as you can see, a very deep red. And um, I don't have that color, 
in my palette. And I didn't bring any special um, colors today. Uh, probably if I were going to be doing this as a, what would I call it, a serious painting, which I don't think this is going to be, um, I would have made some effort to um, work out that color ahead of time, but I'm going to try to reproduce it as well as I can with what is my standard palette, which I might as well tell you about right now, if you're interested. Um, this is the, the basic colors that I use for just about everything. Um, I use a quinacridone burnt scarlet, which is a Daniel Smith color, and it is the same, almost the same, but a little bit livelier, as what they used to call brown matter, which has been determined to be somewhat fugitive. And so I have changed that now to um, Brown matter alizarin? Yeah. Mm -hmm. And um, then I use a um, permanent rose. And a um, um, rose matter, genuine, which I don't use very often, but when I use it, um, it's usually in a mixture. And a, let's see, what have I got here? Oh, uh, um, quinacridone gold, I believe it is. It's, that also is a Daniel Smith color. What's that similar to? It is similar to a um, raw, a raw umber. But it's much stronger color, and it's much more transparent, and, um, uh, it really, all together, is a very lovely color. I uh, have, you know, your palette changes as as time goes on. Mine has changed. Um, um, I keep adding some colors and, and removing others, and. Um, Do you still use sap? No. Well, I, I shouldn't say that. I do. I use sap uh, only for its dyeing qualities in, in certain mixtures, which uh, I don't have it. No, no. I don't think I even brought it with me today. Um, like for your ferns? You yeah, them? right. When it's, uh, for things like that where I wanted something that's I could put into a mixture that will dye the paper so that I can scrape. I paint with the... Um, tail end of my brush as much as I do with the bristle end of it. Which maybe today I'll have a chance to, I don't know what's going to happen with these flowers, but I may, I may be able to use that to show you how I do it. Okay, there's all kinds of interesting little tails and hairs poking out from this thing. What did you replace for sap? I don't. I, I don't, normally I don't use any two greens. Is alizarin crimson off your list now? I, I have always hated alizarin crimson. There you go. <laughs> I have always hated it. It is a dull color. An unequivocal answer. That's what we want. <laughs> Boy, you bet. <laughs> now I'm going to change the shape of these leaves here a little bit because I want to be able to connect this um, to the side of the painting over here. So I'm just kind of, uh, I'm inventing leaves here. It's not necessary, as I say, nobody's gonna be able to come along afterwards and say, but that's not where that leaf was, because these will be dead then and they'll be gone and nobody will ever know. <laughs> and I'm not gonna tell them. But we know. <laughs> and you'll tell, I know you. <laughs> I'll tell. <laughs> For a price. <laughs> Sure, you're in silence here. Mm. Difficult. Yeah, I'll bet you're expensive. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> Do you paint a certain brand name? I uh, mostly I cleave to Windsor Newton um, for most things. Now, since Daniel Smith has come out with his line of watercolors, I am finding 
that um, they are very high quality. The ones I've tried, I don't have too many of them, but the ones I've tried are um, um, are very good. And uh, so I'm I'm using some of those. For example, there's one of his colors which I particularly like. It's called Indian Throne Blue, and it's an, it, I used to use uh, indigo. And um, Indian Throne Blue. It's spelled, I think, just about like it sounds. Um, as I say, it's a Daniel Smith color. And um, it's lighter than indigo. No, it's much darker and it's much more intense and it's a very lively blue. It's got a lot of zip to it. It's, it I mean, it really is blue. Uh, indigo goes gray in, in, in uh, well, it's gray to begin with, but it, it also grows, goes gray in mixtures. Could you hold up again? You betcha. Mm -hmm. Kind of inventing a glass here. Check. What kind of pencil are you using with? This is a actually it's a drafting pencil. It's a lead holder. It's not really a pencil. It's just a a um, a thing that just you can yeah. slip a lead into of different grades and. Um, what size are you using now? This is a grade B lead, which is the one I like for, for uh, sketching on watercolor paper because it's soft enough to erase easily, and yet it is, um, I'm taking out that faint grid line that I put in there before, um, and it's very easy to sharpen. If I want a really sharp point on it, I have a little widget here. It's a little um, thing, I just stick it in there and turn it a couple of times, and I can come out with a needle tip on the mm. pencil. This has little stainless steel cutters in it that just go around and, and sharpen it. Well, Liz, I do very little watercolor, but I found when I erased, then it made the paper behave differently, and I... Do you have a special touch with Well, I use a special eraser for one thing. This is a, this eraser that I'm using is called a magic rub, and it really is a drafting eraser. It's a plastic, and it, it is probably the least damaging. It's even milder than a pink pearl or art gum, and it does a better job of cutting through the, uh, well, I don't know whether that's going to turn out to be a plaid or not, but we'll hope. Anyway, I'm just barely touching the paper with this eraser now, and I'm not doing it just in a straight line. I'm kind of just sort of going over that so that if it does discolor the wash behind it, some, it, uh, it won't matter too much. All right, now we're ready to start splashing. <laughs> the yellow the lemons to be absolutely clean and perfect. But because of the dark roses, I think what I'm going to want is a light background. I'm going to make this a fairly high key. I'm just talking out loud now. This is what's going through my head, so if my syntax isn't perfect, forgive me. Um, I'm just thinking now, I've got the red roses here. I can certainly introduce some bring that over here. I've got the yellow echoed. I can put some little bit of the yellow up in here. So I think I probably can go with a pretty neutral background. Pretty neutral background. 
Ah, yes. A chance to use my favorite triad. You guys know what a triad is? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Triad is any combination of the three primary colors from which you can um, mix just about any other color that you want. And um, different triads will produce different combinations of color. Turn this around. <laughs> that doesn't work at home either. <coughs> okay, so I'm going to mix up quite a quantity. I'll use that brush. Use this one. Uh, oh, I started to talk about materials and tools and so forth. Um, I have at home probably a complete set of red sable brushes that I never use anymore. The only sable brush that I use is this one, which is a, um, a Grumbacher Aquarelle. And it's a, it's a red sable. These things sell for about $150 now. I've had this one for so long. I think I paid four and a half for it. <laughs> I don't remember. But I have some sable brushes from when I was 16. Well, if you take care of them, they last forever. Anyway, this is a marvelous brush, and I would not replace this with a synthetic under any circumstances, but as far as the other red sables are concerned, Chief Joe, and I, believe me, I, I'm not on his payroll, although I probably could be. Chief Joe has come up with the answer to a watercolorist's prayer in that he has come up with this whole series of brushes called Golden Fleece. They're probably the cheapest brushes you can buy. They're very, very inexpensive. And they're the best brushes I have come across. I use shadows down here at the bottom, uh, but I wanted to kind of cover a little bit of that white paper down there so that I can get a better idea of the values that I need to hold in the uh, rest of the uh, these objects. After all, this is really what I'm painting. I'm not painting all the rest of this stuff, but I want to kind of push that back just a little bit so I can see the values a little bit more clearly. Okay. <coughs> anybody, anybody, everybody else can see? All right, now. I'll just start putting in some underpainting here. Um, I'm going to um, underpaint the roses now also to kind of just establish my values in the color so that as I go along I'll have a better handle on where I'm heading. So I'm going to underpaint those because they're very dark. I'm going to underpaint them with a really bright pink. This is, um, again, permanent rose. And I'm just using the pure color because I'm going to be covering most of it up. And I want it to be a fairly good zippity-doo type pink. And because I'm not really too awfully worried about the shape of these roses, I can kind of make them, you know, roughly any shape that I choose, really, and they'll come out maybe looking like roses. She said, <laughs> she said confidently, not knowing anything about our painting. That's a pretty color. Well, it's the brightest pink I've got. And as I say, if I had thought or if I'd known, I didn't know what I was going to paint until about 10 minutes before I left the house this morning. <laughs> so I um, can't exactly so say. Artists that. don't have to plan. That's, that's a given? No, that is definitely plan, plan, plan. That is not a given. See, I missed that lesson. <laughs> if you fail to plan, you plan to fail. Is that right? Oh. Mm. Didn't that sound <laughs> ominous? Yes. 
May we quote you? <laughs> well, I'm quoting somebody else, so yes, be <laughs> Not original. Whatever happened to the watercolor that you did for us last time? It was a whole city made of uh, vegetables. Ah. There was carrots and broccoli, mm. and we yeah. wanted that picture. Yeah. Somebody bought it. Oh. Can you believe that? <laughs> yep. Yes, yes, yeah. gorgeous. Eggplant. Plans. Well, I did. I know you wanted vegetables. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, this is nice. It's good. When the, when you first started the, uh, trying to watercolor after you had lost your eye, you had a lot of difficulty, did you? I still do. Oh, you do. I just wondered how that worked. Well, you know, I started off thinking, by gosh, I'm not going to let this get me, and. It's not going to make any difference. I can, I can overcome this. No big deal. And so I bravely jumped in. And over the last uh, two and a half, three years, I have discovered that uh, in spite of my good intentions, it really made a big difference. And there's just, there's just no substitute for sight. Mm -hmm. That's right. And if you can't see it, you can't paint it. So the composer managed to do Beethoven, you know, all those composers can do it deaf, but artists can't do it blind. Well, I think you can. I've always said that I was, I was saving sculpture for when I lost my sight. Ah. But, uh, and surprisingly enough, you know, I, I make jewelry, and although it, it also is difficult to, to uh, the big problem is the depth perception. Mm -hmm. yeah. That's one of the problems. But um, I've had to recant some of my earlier brave resolve because I'm finding that I absolutely cannot see enough detail to paint the same way that I used to. Mm -hmm. Now, that doesn't mean I can't paint. It just means that it is a lot of hard work now, yeah. whereas it used to be easy because I could see what I was doing. Now, I have to really struggle, and it stops being fun. And I'm just scooping up the extra paint here on these little, these little things. Okay, I think now I'll do somewhat the same thing with the lemons. Is it hold up time or does that ruin your watercolor? What? Hold up? Hold up. <laughs> well, you got us gold. Well, I'm really whistling in the dark myself. <laughs> I'm going by the graveyard at midnight. Okay, bigger brush. Now, I'm going to do these lemons. I'm going to do them one at a time, I think. Brush ready here. Um, there are some very interesting colors in these lemons. Um, I'm going to start at the back and work forward. Because I have this high overhead light, I'm going to be modeling these things one at a time. And there is a highlight right on the top of each one, so I have to do one and wait until it dries and then go on to the next. And, uh, 
again, I'm taking and just softening the edge a little bit. And while I have it there, I'm going to pick up just a wee bit of what do I want here, purple. This is Aurelian, yeah. Mm -hmm. Now I'm using purple for the shadows here. Why? Complimentary. Amen. Head of the class. Teacher chat. Alumni. This is ultramarine violet. And I think this is also a Daniel Smith color, if I'm not mistaken. There. Journal Vigilance. He has come down here and do the little. Because when I do the, the uh, texture in this vase, these lines all come down and go into that place. I need to isolate that edge with um, Miskit so that when I come down with those lines, I will still have a clean edge where that lemon comes along. Otherwise, it's going to be very difficult to make that a nice, sharp line. So being as foresighted as I am, I think I can't really put it on. Ladies that are standing, the best seats in the house are right behind, uh, the, over here by the desk, if you want to get a sideways look like we have. You have to bring your own chair with you, however. <laughs> <laughs> folding chairs, yeah. Bonnie, this is a great. If you could bring a chair, this is a great seat here. And add some, um, what I add to it? Um, I'm going to add some, of all dumb things, I'm going to put some cad red in it. Some what? Cad red. Oh. Which is, is going to warm it up and make it a little bit more neutral. I want it to be different than the, um, than the background. Okay, here goes nothing. What is the purpose of what? Yeah, of what you're doing? Of what, what? You know, I've asked myself that many times. <laughs> uh, you mean why? Why did I warm it up? Yeah. I warmed it up because I I want it to stand out and be different than the background. Oh, I can. Because the background is gray. And so now I'm going to just have to kind of approximate. Oh, wait a minute, before I do that. Bitter. Here you are here. I'm going to put a little bit of, um, of um, resist on, the, um, on that lemon. I don't care about the vase because it's going to be darker anyway. But the lemon is going to be lighter. And I don't want to. What's resist? Resist is like a, a masquite or a biscuit. It's a, a, um, a rubber, a latex type of um, emulsion that uh, is water soluble until it's dry. And um, 
I can paint over it once it's dry, and it just preserves the white paper underneath. It'll what come right off. Than this kit or this is, it, they're all just brand names. It's the, same. Oh. It, the brand names are the same thing. This kit is one, Masquoid is another. Uh, this is. Uh, so you're not going to paint the, the vase. You're just going to put that on. No, I'm not going to paint the vase with this. No, I'm. Uh, I'm going to paint the lemon down at the bottom of the vase, or just the top of the lemon. Anyway, but. Uh, Did you put soap on there first? Yes. Um, this maskoid, or miskit, or whatever you want to call it, is uh, very hard on brushes. If it dries in the heel of a brush, the brush is all but ruined. So I put soap in it, and that protects the bristles so that the rubber can't get down in there and dry. And. Um, As long as I wash it out, I'm looking at here. Do you use a liquid soap? Uh, no, I don't. Uh, liquid soap really doesn't do the as good a job of protecting it as the uh, as solid soap is. This is just ordinary face soap. Actually, I had I, I keep losing these things. Um, I had some, what I do is take one of these little hotel bars and just cut a chunk off and put it in a little box. But I can't find it. I mean, I lost it someplace. So what I did this time was I just shaved a bunch of face soap and then wet it and put it in the little box. It does the same thing. Okay, now I need to dry that first before I go too much farther. <laughs> you have to be careful drying this bit with a hair dryer because you can cook it very easily. Mm -hmm. If it gets too cooked, <laughs> It um, polymerizes, and then you can't get it off for love your money. It just turns into like a varnish. And this is very hot, so I don't think that's Do you have trouble with mildew with your paints? Some colors, yes, I do. If they're shut up for any length of time. See, this, well, this is my own little weird system here. I take regular tube paint, squeeze it out into these little cups, and... Um, um, if I don't use a color for any length of time and it's, it's closed up like that, it will mildew. Uh, particularly like cerulean blue is very bad. Windsor blue is very bad. Windsor green is very bad. I don't use those colors. I do use Windsor, uh, I do use cerulean. Um, sometimes uh, meridian will do it too. A lot of colors don't, but uh, those do. That mildew, you can just wash that off? I just scrape the mildew off and go ahead and use it. Mm -hmm. Doesn't seem to hurt it any. Okay, now, where was I? Is there anyone to babysit the gallery Sunday and Monday? Mm -hmm. We have a fabulous. Mm -hmm. Okay, I'm, I'm just really kind of feeling my way along with this vase because I'm. There's a lot of texture to it. But um, it's, I'm, I'm not going to try to do every single little gadget in it. I just want to kind of get the general feel for it here. You'll see me every so often reach over here. If I were you, I'd cancel my Acapulco reservations. <laughs> Don't give up your night job. <laughs> right. Be sure and sign our book when you go out.
Okay, I don't know what I'm doing here, but I'm having fun. Um, I'll hold this up for the moment. I'm, what I'm trying to do is to develop the, the texturing in that glass. Oh, I think you did it. Well, I still have to put the, the stems and things in. Oh, this but, uh, is wonderful. And I'll wait until that dries. I'm learning a lot. I don't know how you don't stick there or not. You probably are learning what not to do more than him. <laughs> All right, I think I need a smaller brush. Now I'm going to take a little bit of um, this Aurelian yellow that I had mixed up here. Not mixed, it's just sitting there actually. And I'm going to put some Antwerp blue with it to get a nice green. But because I don't want a grassy green, I want kind of on the olivey side. It needs to be a little darker than that too, so I'll make those colors up somewhat. I'm going to come in and add just a touch of this pink to it. And that's going to just make it a little darker so that it will look like stem color. Oftentimes as I'm painting, uh, rather than dip over here and get more color, I'll use something that I already have on my palette. I'll take a little bit of this and a little bit of that and a little bit of something else to mix up a totally new color. And somehow or another, I'm not quite sure how it happens, but somehow or another that does seem to lend more color harmony to your picture. That there's a little bit of pink in the green and a little bit of green in the pink and so forth. It, it, uh, that's definitely not dark enough. So I didn't have to go over again. My theory is that it's almost impossible in watercolor to get mud as long as it is applied on the paper, whatever color you mix up in your palette, as long as you put it on your paper positively with one brush stroke, do it just once, and it will still look like a good, clean, clear color, even though it's mud on the palette. mud. I'm going to go to kind of the pink here for the rose stems. Um, I see pink in them. Okay, that's good enough for now. 
come back and work on the lemon some more. Everybody thoroughly bored. They're holding their breath with you. Mm -hmm. Get a little of that green and feed it into my lemon here. What color did you use for the base veins? I guess you call it the pipe. The gray? Yeah. This? Uh -huh. I used this same gray that I mixed up here, okay. but I added a little bit of cad red to it to um, give it a little bit more zip and to darken it. And um, I'm going to take a little bit of um, new gamboge here, just a little bit to strengthen this yellow. Uh, you, I'm sure, are aware of the fact that the the most brilliant color that you see in any object occurs right at the edge of the shadow. between where the light and the dark meet is where you see the really true um, hue. When do you take a rest? When do I take a rest? Uh -huh. I don't. I don't usually. It is straight through, huh? Well, you know, I get started on something. I'm sure that you probably do the same thing. I get started on something, and I get interested in it. And um, it just, uh, yeah, it, the time just goes, and all of a sudden I realize how tired I am. By that time, it's, it's cocktail hour. Make <laughs> better after cocktail? <laughs> <laughs> you know, that's something I've never been able to do, although I have painted watercolors with beer sometimes by accident. <laughs> and coffee. Bread. Years ago, I used to do a lot of painting up at high altitudes, up in the mountains. And I would go out in the morning with two canvases, two pieces of stretched paper, and two beers, and my paints and so forth. And um, one beer I could have after I finished the first painting, the other beer I could have after I finished the second painting. <laughs> That's called motivation. <laughs> chocolate works the same way. <laughs> no, no I, I, I didn't deny myself chocolate in the meantime. <laughs> I'll make just a quick announcement, if I may. Okay, hold up time. <laughs> and sponge and, and say scalpel and then he'd say oops. <laughs> and he'll call you say, I know what I mean when I say oops. What do you mean when you say oops? <laughs> Okay. Dark, dark.
green in there is livening things up. <coughs> That's what it's been needing with a little bit of. Now you mix that green? Yes. I always mix greens. I, the only uh, the only green I, I uh, have in my palette, only two green I have in my palette, is Viridian. And I use that um, for mixing. Strictly mm -hmm. for mixing. Hardly ever use it otherwise. She's Are you thinking your your stems are going to be lighter than your leaves? Yeah, they're not only going to be lighter, but they're going to be a different color. The stems tend to be kind of reddish in this kind of rose, and there's little red edges along the edges of the leaves as well. <laughs> Again, I'm picking up a little color here to give some shape to these leaves. Sounds like a funeral parlor. He's <laughs> creeping around here this <laughs> spring. Well, they won't let me make any noise. Oh. They won't let you make any noise? No, they, they, they didn't you see the shh back there? <laughs> no, I didn't. Why are they being mean to you, Lila? In a sense, this green I'm putting up here is also just an underpainting because actually these little hairy gadgets up here are largely red. But there is some green to them, so I'm using the green as an underpainting for what will eventually be the red. Sylvia, is this take two? Is this take two? <laughs> Does she mean tape also or just take three? It's, shall I say it's two or three? <laughs> <laughs> One of the above. <laughs> two? <laughs> if you put a flamingo in, it might fire. You want a flamingo? <laughs> Don wants a flamingo. That's that. I never will forget that one. What was that? Flamingos. Flamingos? Yeah, when you did the whole long... Oh, those flamingos. Yeah. <laughs> oh, that was a long time ago. years ago. Gee whiz, that must be 15 years ago. Well, that couple had the gallery up on the south jetty. Yeah. And they had the was there. Yeah. Mick and the Norwegian lady. Well, this is in Bandon. No, no, no. no. Bandon. No, uh, this was um, Duffy and Benita. Duffy and Benita Stender had that little gallery, the great whale. Are you talking to Mick and Ellen? Yeah. They were from Berkeley, so I'm talking about Yeah. Uh -huh. This was a, uh, in Bandon. Some friends of, I think they were birthday friends of yours, Larry? Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. I've known them for years. I can't remember who it was. The people that own the gallery? Yeah. yeah. 
No, that's just a, a more green. I don't think we better go into the video in business. It, it comes from the right one. <laughs> oh, <that's laughs> I mean, it's effortless if you do it from right way. I'll try to use that. Oh, that's great. <laughs> Put on a burst of speed here. I'm taking too long. It's almost two o'clock. I've only got till four. <laughs> <laughs> right. Guys are very patient and very nice, very kind to an old favorite ass. Favorite. You know the painting I like so much of yours is the one where the people are all looking out into the ocean oh. and you see all their backsides. <laughs> yep. I did a whole series of those. Oh, I had such a kick out of that. Those were fun because uh, that was a major discovery. I was at the zoo in San Francisco one day with my sister. And um, I was just taking pictures of people in Nota Bank. And nobody would turn around and face towards me. They were all looking at the elephants. And it suddenly dawned on me, looking at this row of backsides, that they were much more interesting than the fronts. <laughs> oh, oh, yeah. And it was a major breakthrough. I must have made 15 paintings of backsides. Mm -hmm. Cigarette. This is the worst one at all. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. Oh. <laughs> when you were lifting, what were you lifting? Uh, the, on the leaves, I put down a blob of dark green, uh -huh. and then I would take a brush that was clean, a clean brush, with um, um, squeezed out, you know, so it was not a thirsty brush, and then just sopped up some of the paint. For the bands? For, yeah, well, not for the bands exactly, but just for highlights to give them a little bit of curl and a little bit of motion to them. I'll come in and put the veins in them uh, afterwards. The veins actually are a little darker, so that'll be easy to do. Now, I think what I need to do is to finish the um, stems and things, so that's my next job here. It's more of my pink. Did you guys hear the, speaking of jokes, did you hear the one about the, the two buzzards that got on the airplane? And each buzzard was carrying a, two dead raccoons. Two dead raccoons? Two dead raccoons. Okay. And the stewardess met them at the guard and said, I'm very sorry, sir, but only one carry on per passenger. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, the, the dirty ones I don't dare tell in public. Oh, good. But on a video. <laughs> <laughs> on a video. <laughs> I have to I have to pretend like I'm a little old gray haired lady. <laughs> okay. What I'm gonna do now is I'm taking some of this pink and some a uh, little bit of the green, but mostly the pink. And I'm gonna come up and put the dark, the reds and things in the um, stems. So this is gonna take a few minutes.
I have to have a brush with um, clear water in it in my hand, or I'm, I'm helpless. Uh, that paper has to be a special paper for you to 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 uh, put it put it on and stretch it like that, doesn't it? Well, it's regular watercolor paper. It is. It's just regular. It's Arches 140 pound um, watercolor paper. It's not anything unusual. Is um, it over a canvas or? No. No. Not at all. Not at all. It's tough. It's really tough paper. I love all these little whiskers here that are sticking out in this thing. No such thing as an inappropriate question. <laughs> how, how do you decide just how you price your film, your pictures? Well, you know that's a toughie. Um, the best thing to do is to, when you're when you're first starting out, it's a lot easier to raise your prices than it is to lower them. So if you start out too high, chances are you're going to have to someday, if you want to sell them at all, you might have to lower your prices. So the best thing to do is to go by experience. In other words, if you, the first painting I ever sold in my life, I sold for ten dollars, and I was so delighted to get that. But then, when that one sold almost immediately, the next one I sold for twenty-five, and the next one after that I sold for thirty-five, and so on. As long as. But at least you started out in dollars. <laughs> True. <laughs> As opposed to bartering. <laughs> I believe in bartering. I have a complete, I do too. I have a complete <laughs> art display in my own bartering. I only paid for one. Oh, absolutely. Listen, artists trade paintings all the time. Liz is the only one that hasn't traded with me. <laughs> yep, yep. Boy. That one almost hit me when I came the shoulder blades. <laughs> it's recording too. <laughs> well, I traded uh, I traded paintings for a piano once. I uh, didn't pay a dental bill for about uh, four years one time in Brookings because the dentist took a liking to my paintings. Surely you're getting your knee surgery done. <laughs> well, <laughs> I had to pay for that. On the other hand, Dr. Lau has been very, uh, he's, he's commissioned probably about six or seven paintings. Yeah. And Dr. Lau did you need? Yeah. I'm going to go to him on the second and hope he'll try to do something for some of my problems. Good. He's pretty good. I'd like to be, I said as long as I'm going to live a hundred years, I might as well get in shape. That's right. I always said if I knew I was going to live so long, I would have taken better care of myself. <laughs> right. Absolutely. Okay. I'm sorry this is uh, kind of laborious here, but it's necessary. Mm -hmm. Liz, are you still doing pastels? I'm having a great deal of fun with pastels, yes. I am doing more pastels than I am what matter of fact, I'm not doing any watercolor, so. Um, yes. Um, but as I say, I'm, st I'm still just learning. I don't count myself as being a pastelist at this don't point. Don't you find them quite easy? Easy? Mm -hmm. God, no. <laughs> I love that answer. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, anything is easy to do. No, anything is easy to do unless you really want to do it well. And if, you're, if you are, are uh, you know, uh, compared to watercolors, 
Oh, I think they're probably easier than watercolors. But even so, um, it's like playing an instrument, you know. I mean, anybody can pick up a, uh, you can sit down at the piano and go dingle 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 and play chopsticks or something. But if you really want to play it well, it's a it's a different kind of a story. And um, what's your instrument? My instrument? Uh huh. Currently, it's a bassoon. <laughs> Uh, what do you play with? Do you play the bassoon with the orchestra? Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's an electronic bassoon. Oh, is it your husband's wonderful thing that, that he's Yamaha playing thing, yeah. Mm -hmm. oh. It makes a wonderful bassoon sound. Yeah. And I'm having loads of fun being a bassoonist. Uh, but what were you before that? Uh, I played the flute before that, a violin before that. I've also now, each orchestra quality, you played the orchestra in the orchestra with both those instruments, did you not? Yes. Well, is everyone a little bit awestruck by that? <laughs> yes. okay. I've been playing the cello for years and I'm not quite up to speed of playing with the orchestra. <laughs> well, you, know, you might be surprised. I would be more than surprised. Stunned. And so, and so would the people that play with me. You know, Sybil and Joni play with me. They have not encouraged me to join the orchestra. Not yet. <laughs> you get older. Play string bass in a, in a trio, jazz trio and uh, on the same instrument. Now I'm putting just little red diddles around the edge of these leaves because they, they, uh, they have them. Sure. Them mm -hmm. Well, it kind, of, it, it kind of sparks it up a little bit. I, I'm just... Tell me, why, why did you quit the violin? My, you are not getting this tape for $10. My first husband did not like it. <laughs> and so I quit, which is the stupidest thing I ever did in my life. tapes and growing. It wasn't worth it. <laughs> yes, I think violin is so beautiful. It is. It is a beautiful instrument. There's no question about it. And I'm very Liz, this is so neat. What? Time to hold it up. <laughs> okay, what I'm doing now, I, I'm just putting the detailing in the leaves. And a gray that I had here to begin with is blue-gray type of thing. I'm going to add a little bit more blue to it, except this time I'm going to add cobalt. And to to cut that blue down a little bit because this is really quite quite a oh I think I have some fun with that I think I'm going to add a little bit of um, yeah, that's better a little <laughs> she talks to herself yeah. I'm adding, I added a little bit of the burnt quinacridone uh, scarlet to it. And so what I'm going to do now is, in one swoop here, I'm going to uh, lay this in, and then I'm going to start playing with it to get that glaze. That great brush sure helps up that. Yeah. Oh yeah, these brushes are absolutely super. I just love them. They hold a lot of paint. They, they keep their points a lot longer than sables do. Mm. And um, they're so cheap that you can have a half a dozen of them. Where do you get them? From Cheap Joe. Cheap Joe? I've heard of Yeah. <laughs> we have his catalog. Okay. Okay. Okay, now. Let me ask one thing about the thick note or something. They're really like. Now, while this is wet, I 
want to start, yeah. I'm going to take a little bit of that. Remember I mentioned Indian Throne Blue? Indian, what? Remember the Indian Throne Blue I mentioned before? No. I'm going to take some of that. And, uh, read a, it if you don't have that, what would be equivalent? I mean, oh, an ultramarine. Probably an ultramarine. What's the difference between French ultramarine and just ultramarine? Well, technically speaking, French ultramarine is a synthetic ultramarine, and plain ultramarine is is a ground up lapis. Mm. So French ultramarine shouldn't cost as much. Then. Well, then actually, it's a pretty Oops. expensive color anyway. Um, I think Daniel Smith is the one that's come out with these old traditional colors um, that are supposedly made the same way that they used to be made. So that would mean that the ultramarine was made with um, with uh, lapis. Whether it actually is or not, I don't know. Mm, you know, I never thought of turning it over. Oh, yeah? A, yeah, no, that's such a good... Yeah, that, that is. Yeah, right. Because yeah. sometimes you want to get it to run. Well, I mean, I, I turn over, but I mean, for, uh, for these other abstract grounds, but not for a realistic one. Well, you know, half uh, gravity works for you. No, you can. Yeah. And so, uh, by manipulating gravity a little bit, you can do wonders. I'm going to put a little yellow over here as a reflection. And I'm going to put a little. <laughs> well, if you haven't painted for three years, you haven't lost it. <laughs> Bless your heart, Lynn. No, she's right. Because yeah. no. <laughs> you know you do lose it if you don't sure use do. it. Lose it or lose it. Your handicap is an encouragement to us. Mm. Ah! <laughs> well, true. Well, yes. actually, it's because the, because the people get elderly, I mean, their their um, vision dims. And um, tell me about it. I mean, some of them will think, well, I can't paint anymore. wait for the. What I want to do now is, I, this is very wet, and I've got some dark in there and some light. I want to wait until it dries just a little bit more, and then I'm going to start floating water into that to get it to run and burble and, and drip and so forth, so I can get somewhat of that glaze uh, texture into it. I want it to run, so. Photography seems to be the worst for eyesight. I mean, my eyes or glasses need adjusting. I can tell right away if it's Bowman. Yeah. With my big camera. Mm -hmm. out of focus. Are you trying to make, blo are you going to get blossoms that way then? That <laughs> I'm trying to get dribbles. Dribbles, not blossoms. So not blossoms, but dribbles. Uh -huh. mm -hmm. Well, I was blind on one eye, or practically blind. I couldn't see any. At all. Uh, um, they, I was surprised. I went to have a heavy driver's test in the one eye. It was perfect, you know. And I took the other eye and I said, forget it. I couldn't see a darn thing. And uh, you didn't even realize it. I didn't realize it. And then, then uh, they made me have the, the cataract removed of that eye. And that eye was better than the other one. So, did you have a cataract for the other one? Yeah, I have one on each eye. Yeah, yeah, that one. They say, they're both. That a wonderful they, thing they, they yeah. removed them, <coughs> and the only thing is now I have distant yeah. vision. Because you're not having glasses or yeah. anything? Yeah, I cannot. I only have to use glasses, I have to try. That's really going to stretch your I just take the time. Yeah, I am. Do you ever paint on 300 pounds, Liz? No, I don't like 300 pounds. Why don't you like it? Because I don't like it. <laughs> well, it doesn't thing, work right or something. Well, it's got an awful lot of sizing in it, for one thing. Uh, much more sizing than I like. And they say that you don't have to um, stretch it. Mm -hmm. um, that may be, but it still buckles. It buckles just enough 
to be enormously annoying to me. It, it goes this way, you know, just mm -hmm. big things like that. So you're, if you're painting very wet, your, your paint just goes down into the valleys, and you have no control over it. If you soak that long enough in the bathtub, could you get some of that sizing off? Yeah, you have to. I always do that if I get stuck with using it, which I try not to because I really don't like it. I don't like the texture of it. I don't like the surface of it. Which, which paper? 300 I'm talking about 300 pound. Yeah, I put a wet towel But this is rough. You're using this is rough. 40 rough. That's right. Stretching it tends to take some of the uh, roughness out of it. It, it strips. Does it make it down to like a cold press then? No. No, not that much. Not that much. Hmm. But you could do this with a cold press. Oh, oh, absolutely. You could do a hot press. Yeah, you can you can stretch any paper, but you can't stretch the little town paper. It's too stiff. It's too much cardboarding. But it has such an unfriendly surface. It's got so much sizing in it, and it still buckles. When you paint well, I'm happy to hear you say that because it's expensive. it's too expensive to buy anyway. Yeah. <laughs> well, Doris told my son in his very bad oh, no. <laughs> way to not use anything else but elephant three hundred pounds. Oh. I've never oh. used an elephant. Oh, okay. But you know it's sad. You see, the wind, if you're watercolor. What'd you say? Yeah. How many how many paintings you have to Coast? Are you talking to me? Yes. Um, how many paintings do I have at Sutter Coast? Is that what you said? I have uh, b -b 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 three. Uh, there's one large one in the lobby of a carousel horse. And then there's, one and there's the old Sutter Coast Hospital. And there's the one of no. the old Sutter Coast Hospital. And the people sitting on the seaside. That's what yeah. it's called. And one of the three gals on the bench. I think those are the only three that are there. And then the building right behind you, you have yeah. the triptych in the lobby. What kind? Triptych. Huh. Yeah, there's a mural in the lobby and um a and Mm -hmm. I wrote it in. Is that you? And then, uh -huh, that's her. Oh, and then Dr. Lau, his whole stuff. office is filled oh, with. Uh, yeah. There's one of hers on the stairway. Yeah, and, and the mm -hmm. stairwell mm -hmm. going up right. Mm -hmm. When you're talking about the building behind me. Oh, uh -huh, yeah. where yeah. all the doctors oh. hang out. Yeah. But <laughs> 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 yeah. you don't want to go. <laughs> when I first saw them, I was trying to figure out a way I could steal them. <laughs> <laughs> they do get stolen. Do they really? Yes, they do. Well, mm. uh, I wish I had that one with the mom and dad. They've got some kind of a uh, hookup that you, they mount them. They can't be taken off the wall because they do get taken off the hmm. wall. Do they really? Mm. Oh, yeah. I yeah. Dr. Lau. I'm very oh, disappointed. They had just had some prints of mine and <laughs> they got packed off. Oh, really? Whoa. Well, that's the greatest yeah. compliment. <laughs> They say that's double the price is a bad thing. We apologize for not having a male front because people are stealing because they're small. Yeah, I'm, I'm jealous now. Well, they, they, <laughs> they even take big ones because uh, we eat at that uh, uh, restaurant in, I can't think of the name, but uh, in uh, Rukin. And they, uh, these are more Chinese. I thought they're Chinese. And, uh, that they stole them. Yeah. And then they were good sized. Uh, I don't well, know I, how they meant. This is a heavy. I don't think they could put them under their coat. I think they got them kind of screwed to the wall. Yeah, I think they, they do. They yeah. probably yeah, do. Yeah, yeah, I think that's a good idea. <laughs> and in the hospital, I'm sure they do. Would you explain again how you put that paper on that stretcher? I sure will. Can you wait just a moment? Sure. I will do it with hand gestures. Friendly hand gestures. Do you have any new photos of uh, books and music or whatever? Or oh, words and pictures? Words and pictures. <laughs> words and pictures. Um, I have a, a, one of my pastels down there. A large, oh, yeah. A what are you doing for subject pastel? matter for pastels? What? What kind of subject matter are you doing? Well, this. Oh, I, I'm still experimenting with that. I, I do all kinds of different things. You this can do anything with a Pascal. Just about. Yeah. Yeah. I've done a lot. I, well, of course, since you, I've done, um, I've done pastel portraits for some time, and probably my masterpiece is uh, the one I did that's at the senior center of my sister, who uh, passed away about six years ago, 
and they wanted a, she was quite a benefactor of theirs, and they commissioned me to do a portrait, which I did in Pasta, and I must say, all due modesty, it's probably the best thing I've ever done. Mm. Well, so if it's better out of a labor of love, the only